Say it. Dark Souls 2 is a masterpiece. It is, without a doubt, the greatest game ever made in terms of complexity, originality, and functionality. Nothing else in gaming history has ever compared to the absolute perfection that is Dark Souls 2. Not good enough. Hello everyone and welcome. Today I am beating Dark Souls 2 at Soul Level 1. Now I'm sure that my intro has painted a rather sarcastic picture of my take on this game and maybe you're already yelling at me in the comments about how good it actually is, so I would like to take a second to make my stance on Dark Souls 2 perfectly clear. Dark Souls 2 is a good game. Dark Souls 2 at Soul Level 1 is a steaming pile of shit. I would rather use a cactus as a catheter than have to play this game at Soul Level 1 again. To be fair, in addition to literally everything you would expect me to complain about, I also just don't know this game anywhere near as well as FromSoft's other titles, thus making this challenge even more difficult for me. Prior to this run, I have beaten this game exactly three times, and that was just to get 100% without eating the PvP, so I kinda had no clue what to do. For example, I thought this was the mace, but it's actually the Morningstar, and I immediately had to Google where to find the real mace. When I did Blood Level 4, I actually followed Press Continue's guide pretty closely, but I thought for this time around, I would just wing it. I have watched his and other SL1 videos in the distant past, so I had a general idea of what I should do, but for the most part, I'm going to be completely in the dark. Awesome! First thing I did was grab a dagger, because at least I could use it properly, then head off to the Forest of Fallen Giants. I remember in the past, this little jump would trick me, but not this time. I forgot they remapped the jump button. Oh, that is a lovely shade of gang green I got going on. So my first goal was to get a not terrible weapon. Unfortunately, my only option right now is the mace, but wouldn't it be cool if I could use, like, a katana and a gun? Well, I don't have that option in Majula, but I can in today's sponsor, Wanted Dead. 110 Industries was kind enough to reach out to me with an advanced copy of this game, and I absolutely love it. I never knew I needed a hack and slash crane game kicking karaoke sing and ramen eating simulator, but boy am I glad I have it now. Wanted Dead is a passionate love letter to the PS3, Xbox 360 era of games where you can just sit down for a grand old time and it delivers with stylish finishers, crazy mini games, and overall fun and unique madness. I mean, the game is literally a hack and slash gun foo em up, and if that sentence doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. But hey, if you're watching my channel, Channel, maybe you're used to something a little more difficult and are worried this game won't scratch that itch. Well, guess what? Wanted Dead has a Japanese hard mode. Never have three simple words struck such fear into my heart, and for good reason too when you consider the team behind this game also worked on renowned titles like Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive. Mmm, I can feel the pain already and that's right up my alley. The game also has incredible style, drawing heavy inspiration from the visual aesthetics of the late 80s, resulting in a captivating experience that is entertaining, hilariously funny, and brimming with eccentricity. Wanted Dead is truly a hidden gem, and I cannot recommend it enough. You can use my link in the description below to get up to 50% off on this absolute banger of a game available on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Wait, did I say 50% off? That's crazy! Almost as crazy as the amount of fun you'll be having playing Wanted Dead. The sale will last until September 4th on Steam, September 5th on Xbox, and September 13th on PlayStation, so what are you waiting on? Dive into the vibrantly gory world of Wanted Dead right now. Thanks again to 110 Industries for sponsoring this video, now back to our regularly scheduled programming. In order to get the maze, I need to get Leningrast into his house, so I buy the key from Malentia and do exactly that. This weapon is serviceable. It hits hard, at least relatively, and has great stagger potential but that range leaves a lot to be desired. Not to mention it's kinda heavy in the stamina usage department. For now it'll work, but I already know the exact point in the game I want to switch weapons. Back to the Forest of Fallen Giants, I demonstrate why I flunked out of the Firebomb Academy, then take on the Pursuer. I don't know why, but I'm feeling a little nervous for this fight. I think it's just because it's been so long since I played this game, but early game in Soul Level 1 is generally no different than a normal playthrough. And it's not like the Pursuer is gonna show up multiple times and be stronger each time or anything. Anyway, my fear was unjustified, as many enemies, including the Pursuer, can be bested by the unbeatable strategy of strafing to the right. He drops the Ring of Blades, which is a nice little boost to my attack rating, and something that'll stick on my finger for a majority of this run. I buy a Fragrant Branch of Yore from Alentia, but that's only so I can get the Silver Serpent Ring plus one quickly. All that's left to do now is take on the Last Giant. Definitely one of the easiest bosses in the whole series, he only has a few very slow telegraphed attacks. Can we, uh, edit that out? At about halfway through the fight, the giant decides to give himself a hand, literally, but it doesn't matter. The damage I have, coupled with that long animation of ripping one's own arm off, is enough to bring him down. I then decided to go get the stone ring. Definitely not because I thought this troll had to be defeated for a different item and I'm just stupid. Nope, I totally did this on purpose. 
Down on the beach where I actually wanted to be, there are two more trolls. I don't exactly want to fight them at the same time, so I tried to lure one away, but he had had enough of my shenanigans and just wanted to set this one out. I didn't even know the pursuer could spawn here, but it seems small slopes are his one true enemies and he kind of just pieces out. After defeating the second troll, I returned to Millibeth for the Handmaiden's Ladle, honestly one of the most overpowered weapons in this game. It would make this run too easy, so I'm just going to use it in my offhand for its bonus effect of providing one point to vigor and endurance, but more importantly, two whole points to adaptability. I make my way through the Lost Bastille totally in one piece until I get to McDuff who says he'll help me on my journey if I light up his life or something like that. And for a price, of course. Uh, trust me, there's always a price. Souls are in a weird state of being both extremely important and not important at all in this run. Dark Souls 2 easily awards the most souls per fight of any game, but in Soul Level 1, I can't use them for their primary purpose. Well, that's not a problem because Dark Souls 2 also has the most amount of useful consumables you can buy. Namely, life gems. I frequently find myself back in Majula to top off my supply, but this time I notice Malintia has an extra item, a subscribe button. And it looks like it's free, so don't forget to press it, and while you're at it, how about a comment on how fast you think I'll lose my sanity in this run? Back on track, I want to get the fragrant branch of yore from this chest, but the pursuer thinks that he can best me. Well, he can. Twice. But like I've always said, the amount of times you die plus one is the charm and he goes down. At this point, my health is starting to look a little bleak, and I want to fix that, but I'm too stingy to use human effigies. Luckily, there is a ring in the early game that can do it for me. So over in Hyde's Tower of Flame, I show this Hyde Knight hammer beat sword and grab the ring of binding. As long as I wear this, my max health won't go below 75%, which might not sound like much given my small health pool, but there are a surprising amount of attacks that can be survived even at soul level 1. Which is good, because there are an equal amount of bullshit hitboxes that can't be avoided at soul level 1. I make my way towards the shaded woods where I encounter a petrified Rosabeth and let me just say she's not the only thing turned to stone around here. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. In Silent Woods, I make sure to get shot point blank in the back and pick up the Claranthe ring plus one for that sweet, sweet stamina regen. This one might as well be super glued to my finger as it's never coming off. The ghost enemies here really suck. Mostly because I can't lock onto them, but also because the dagger swings much faster than my maze and it makes approaching them a right pain in the dick. Speaking of Scorpioness Nashka, she's an easy boss, but my Ungabunga brain saw that item in the tree and I needed it. So first I tried to bait her into using a tail swipe, but she instead swiped left on me with her spear. Then I realized I could just get her to dig up the ground under me. Fortunately, she read my profile and knew I wanted to be crushed and did exactly that. Now, I'm sure this item was worth it. Flame butterflies. No, not even butterflies. Flame butterfly. Singular. Well, at least it'll be good for kindling our tinder match or something. Seriously though, Nashka is a pretty easy boss, though I will say given the game's reputation, I have no idea how that attack didn't connect. I quickly go and grab the light crossbow, which unironically was one of the single best decisions I made in this whole run. While I'm here, I also turn on my various stones to the Crow Twins and learn that this game's fall damage is absolutely cracked. Lastly, I murder Moglin for the Seldora set. I could and probably should have done this way sooner, but something about murdering NPCs always freaks me out. With that, I settled in to start farming the peasants. It's gonna be a long grind, isn't it? Well, no, actually. I apparently have 99 in luck and the pieces dropped after three runs. Since that didn't take so long, I figured I might as well do some more grinding on these guys for some Titanite chunks, but my luck here actually kinda ran dry and I needed to join the Covenant of Champions to make sure that they kept respawning. After a while, I was able to make my mace a plus 10 thanks to the slab I picked up from earlier. I then proceed to abandon the Covenant because I am a casual and I don't want to make this run harder than it already is. Up next is the Congregation. Not a particularly hard boss, but I also know if I drop my guard for one second, this could end poorly. Fortunately, I played patiently and they go down on the first First try. I grab a fragrant branch from Scorpion Bro for later, then backtrack all the way to McDuff to infuse my weapon with raw damage. I'll be honest, I have no clue if this was the right call. I knew since I wasn't leveling up any of my stats that damage infusions for scaling wouldn't make much of a difference, but the way this game handles resins, I didn't know. I figured raw plus whatever resin would be the best way. Regardless, I test out my damage on the Ruined Sentinels. Yep, that's pretty good. They still took me a few tries because am bad, but that's another boss off the monster checklist. I could go to the Lost Center now, but decide instead to go back to Hyde's Tower of Flame and beat up the Dragon Rider. I attempted the pacifist kill on him, but messed it up. That's okay though, because my plus 10 mace messed him up instead. I then have Lycia open up the way because convenience and arrive in Huntsman's Cops. Oh, hello there, Forlorn. What took you so long? That sure is a large sword you have there. Must be nice to have that kind of reach advantage. Well, it's fine, as long as I don't do something stupid like dolphin dive into a bottomless pit when you're almost dead. You know what? That one's on me. The crossbow is my best friend here, picking everything off from afar, and eventually I find myself in the domain of the Skeleton Lords. Similar to the congregation, this boss is usually a complete joke, but due to my rather pathetic health bar, I couldn't afford to get careless. 
I take out the Bone Wheel Skeleton Lord first because even though they are a lot less annoying in this game, they would absolutely be the enemy to ruin this attempt if I let them. After that, it's just a matter of kiting the absolute horde of enemies around the room and taking shots when there's an opening. In Harvest Valley, I totally don't get distracted by the amazing chests ahead and die to make my way to the best boss in the whole game, Jabba the Hutt. I'm aware that was a low-hanging fruit joke, but is it really my fault when this boss is the joke? Anyway, up through the windmill, taking my time with my best friend the crossbow, eventually I light the whole place on fire, then at the top I handle a mimic, and by that I mean it poisons itself to death. It drops the work hook, which increases my dexterity by 5 while reducing my ADP by 3. You might be wondering why I would ever want to use that considering I'm basically already at nothing ADP anyway, and dexterity isn't the primary scaling stat for my mace. Well that's because it's finally time to switch to the most overpowered weapon in this game, the rapier. Unfortunately, I don't have enough dex to use it, and I can't two-hand it to fix that, but there are a couple pieces of gear that increase my dexterity, one of which I can easily get right now. Back in the Forest of Fallen Giants, I meet up with an NPC named Kale. For some reason, he immediately gives me a key to his house? Uh, I guess I just have a trustworthy face? Yeah, I'm sure that won't come back to haunt him. Anyway, in his mansion are a couple of items, but most importantly is Kale himself. Right, well, I guess you shouldn't give keys to people you just met. Anyway, Kale's helmet increases dexterity by one point, enough for me to use the rapier. Unfortunately, I didn't bother to level it up, so it would have just been objectively worse than the mace right now. Uh, guess I didn't need to murder Not Broccoli just yet. Oh well. Next, I take on Mitha, and she tries to give me head, but I'm not really in the mood for anything fun, so I just die instead. Wait, that's not right. I take her out instead. I then take a very long elevator ride up to a floating lava land in the sky. Yeah, I don't know either. Where do I even start with this place? Technically, Smelter Demon is an optional boss, but since I plan on doing every boss in this run, is he really though? The problem is there's like, a small battalion of enemies between he and I? Combine that with Dark Souls 2 not having a lot of iframes on the boss fog walk, or pretty much any kind of interaction, this place isn't a good time. However, there is another mechanic I can make use of here. I'm sure most of you know this, but just in case you don't, it's actually possible to fight the enemies so many times that they stop spawning. Apparently it varies depending on the enemy, but most of them are 12 times, so if I just slowly murder my way through all of these knights over and over, eventually the boss runback will be void of any life. This won't be the last time I employ this method, either. My first try on the Smelter Demon was going pretty great, until it wasn't. Oh well, back to grinding the enemies to literal dust, I suppose. This is actually the zone I wanted to start using the rapier with. Way earlier in the run, I complained about the mace's reach, and this is one of the best examples of it. Sure, it hits hard, but because the AI is designed to attack as soon as I'm within range for it to connect, the alone knights just outspace me. What? Oh, the game crashed. I guess even it hates this area. Thanks, Dark Souls 2. At this point, I had made my way through the zone like eight or so times, but I was already over the mace's range and wanted to fix it. So I headed over to Brightstone Cove to grab a few chunks and also listen to the single most soothing noise I have ever heard. I make the rapier a plus 10 and infuse it with the power of raw, then make my way back to the alone knights. Thankfully, I can easily just have them walk into my thrust and after only a couple more passes, they finally start to spawn. You know, I'd complain that this place feels empty now, but honestly, I prefer it this way. With everything cleared, I can finally focus on the actual boss who is much easier than the run back, which is more than I can say about his blueberry variant, but that's for later. You might be expecting me to say something about his janky hitboxes, but honestly, all of my deaths to Smelter were just me making mistakes and mistiming dodges. On the winning attempt, the fight was actually over fairly quickly because of how late he phase transitioned. The first one happened at about half health, and the second one at maybe 25%. He takes reduced damage during, but since there isn't an explosion, I can still hit him, then he immediately goes for his jumping attack, and that was it. Fight's over. The second half of Iron Keep is marginally easier, since there's a bonfire just before the boss, I only have to make it through once, but it's time for the rematch of the century, Iron Bear of the Curse vs Knight Zoolander. After a well fought battle, he goes down, dropping the Ring of Blades plus one, which is literally just an upgrade to my damage. I am playing the world's most dangerous game of chicken. Correction, I have won the world's most dangerous game of chicken. Alright, old Iron King, everyone knows the real danger isn't the actual boss, it's the random hole from software put in the arena. As long as I'm mindful of that, I should be fine. What, did you expect a montage of me getting blasted into that hole? Have some faith, dear viewer, I'm sometimes competent at video games. Anyway, old Iron King goes down on the first try. So I didn't just do Iron Keep now because I wanted to hate myself, it's because I wanted to get more powerful before progressing further into the game. Since I shut off the fire, I can grab the Iron Key, then take that over to the Forest of Fallen Giants where I'm able to get the Heavy Iron Key, which will allow me access to Broom Tower. I'm not here to actually do the DLC, I'll save that for later, I'm just here for... Oh, piss off, Forlorn. As I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, I'm only here for the Dex Ring, which means I can replace the Work Hook with the Ladle and reclaim some lost ADP and still use the Rapier. 
I'm still not done with this build, but the other items I want are in an out of reach area currently, and it's time to take on some bosses. First up is everyone's favorite arachnid, Rachnera. If you got that reference, welcome fellow degenerate. Thanks to the dex ring, I can one hand the rapier, which means I can also use the torch to keep the small spiders at bay. This fight isn't particularly hard if you can't do that, but it's absolutely trivial if you can, and the Duke's dear Freya goes down on the first try. Next up on the chopping block is the Lost Sinner, another one of the bosses notorious for having questionable hitboxes. That being said, I actually didn't experience anything noteworthy. It might be because of my slightly increased ADP stat, or maybe I've just finally gotten good, I don't know, but she goes down on the first try as well. Now it's time to take on Blight Town 2.0. This place isn't so bad as long as you take it slow. Is what I would like to say, but when I got all the way to the bottom, this asshole baited me into an attack and I fell to my death. So yeah, this place sucks. One thing I haven't mentioned is that I've been buying Bright Bugs, and I haven't actually done that since the Lost Center, since they're getting kind of expensive, so before I take on the Rotten and overwrite Malincia's stock, I thought I would take on a couple more bosses to have the souls to buy them. So, it's Discount Sift time, and yes, I realize the irony of that joke given the name of my channel. The Royal Rat Authority isn't a hard boss, it's the ads in the arena that make the fight difficult, but you already knew that. All of my deaths here were attributed to being staggered by the small one, which Wombo comboed me into the bigger one. Either way, the boss eventually goes down and gives me 14,000 souls, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. I farm another 10k off these grim warriors, also hoping for a couple chunks that never drop, then buy the final bright bug I can. Now it's time for the rotten. Fortunately for me, this boss stinks. You know, maybe all those bad hitbox jokes were a lie. Anyway, the rotten goes down on the first try, which, now that I think about it, all of the Lord Souls have gone down on the first try. The bosses in this game are kinda easy, aren't they? You know, I'm honestly surprised that doesn't do damage just to be a dick to the player. Dumpster Fire the boss here told me I need to head towards a big castle, so I do just that. This game is easy, I don't understand why anyone says it's hard. To be honest, there was nothing of interest that happened here. I got invaded by the Nameless Usurper, which shows me from software model an NPC after my PvP ability. The Twin Dragon Riders... exist? I took a great arrow to the back and it didn't kill me at soul level 1, so that should be all you need to know about how easy this boss fight is. Fortunately, there's a much better boss in the Looking Glass Knight. Hey, there's the funny hitboxes everyone talks about. The fight itself isn't so bad, it's just a standard dude in armor but packing an invincible shield. The real problem are the summons. To be honest, I'm so bad at doing PvP style fights, it might as well be him summoning another full boss. Also, it's possible for him to summon an actual player? Uh, fortunately for me, I have never seen him do that. I'm not gonna lie though, on the winning attempt, he just didn't summon anything. I don't know if he felt bad for me or what, but I'll take it, especially considering the next place up is... The Shrine of Amana. Oh joy. Here's a fun little side story for you all. While I was slowly, and I mean slowly, clearing out this area, I had to step away from my keyboard. Since I knew I would only be about 5 minutes, I decided to just stand where I was, thinking it was perfectly safe. That was my first mistake. See, I had forgotten that Dark Souls 2 is always online. You may or may not have noticed, but in every video I do, I'm always offline, and that is because I hate PvP. Well, big surprise, I got invaded while I was AFK. Dark Spirit Vale here got an easy kill on me, and when I returned, I was standing by the bonfire. Honestly, I thought I just missed a patrolling enemy that had a huge aggro range or something because that's pretty on point for this game. No big deal, I'll just go back to slowly clearing out the enemies to make some progress. So I do exactly that, and just before I got to the midway point, I got invaded again by the same player. Now, I didn't actually know that this was my second invasion until I checked the recording later, or that it was the same person. So here I am trying to show that I am weak little soul level 1 player and not a threat, please leave me alone. But this dude just immediately draws a lightning bow on me like some kind of hollowed Robin Hood. Realizing that we can't be friends, I do the only logical thing. Throw myself into the murky abyss. Upon revival, I immediately burn a human effigy so I can be left in peace, or as peaceful as I can be in the Shrine of Amana. I know people enjoy invasions. The feeling of an asymmetric fight, taking on the host in their own world, it's a cool concept. But I am not one of those people. Even in Elden Ring, the game where you can't be invaded playing solo without a specific item, I still play in offline. This actually isn't the only time I got invaded in this run, either. Anyway, I continue on until I get to the uniquely designed, but ultimately piss-easy boss, the Demon of Song. I know this thing has, like, at least three attacks, but it only ever did the tall standing slam in the two-armed combo. Dark Souls 2 Baby Easy Mode is going to write itself, I swear. Aldia, you'd probably make more friends if you'd stop exploding all over them. You want to know how little I remember my time in Dark Souls 2? I thought you were supposed to destroy the bell, not the gravestones. Nameless Usurper once again teaches me that the longer your stick is, the better off you are, but other than that, there's nothing to say about the undead crypt, just a neat location I breeze through. Bell's stat is a cool looking boss, but he's also incredibly underwhelming. 
The only danger in this particular run is that if I accidentally block an attack, my stagger window is longer than his combo and is just guaranteed death. Not that I should be blocking an SL1, it's just a habit when I try to learn a moveset. Anyway, once I learn to just stay out of the way of his two-ton hammer, the fight becomes trivial. Wow, big surprise, right? Just don't get hit. With King's Ring in hand, the end of the game draws near, but as this is an all-bosses challenge, I'm actually only like half done, so with that in mind, I decided to take on a small bit of the DLC for some more items. Remember how at the beginning of the video I said I finished the game three times? Well, I've also done the DLC once, so I'm a little terrified, but I have no choice other than to brave the storm. First, I make my way back to the Broom Tower where I promptly get one shot by a random enemy. Fortunately, there are actually plenty of cheeky angles I can use to pick enemies off from a distance. Eventually, I make it all the way to the Burnt Tower where I get invaded by a random NPC. I decided to head back in an attempt to find a shortcut in case I died, and I learned that if you run far enough away, NPC invaders will despawn from your world? I honestly had no idea, but that's neat. I walk into the smelter room fully prepared to become extra crispy undead, but surprisingly that doesn't happen. Now I can reactivate the elevators and using the power of critical thinking, I can pick up the simpleton's ring. This item boosts ADP by 5, but at the cost of taking up a valuable slot. Luckily, I have an answer for that too. I make my way from the fire DLC to the ice DLC. Of the three, this one is definitely the one I was most nervous for, but this is no time to get cold feet, so I press on. Eventually, I grab the eye of the priestess and run into an NPC that looks suspiciously like Oscar. Unfortunately, it's not Oscar, and I get introduced to the business end of a massive hammer. Not the last time that'll happen in this run, I'm sure. Now it's finally time to take on a DLC boss, Ava the King's Pet. I like this fight. She has a nice diverse moveset, not too fast but not too slow, hits approximately as hard as an SUV sized tiger should, let's just be happy that FromSoft didn't add a hitbox to her sprinting away because you know they thought about it. On the winning attempt my rapier almost broke which is not a good sign for things to come but I'm sure it'll be fine. Anyway, she goes down and now I can pick up one of the items I came here for, the vessel shield. This nigh essential piece of equipment increases vigor, endurance, adaptability, faith, and intelligence by one and strength and dexterity by four. But there's something else I can get to help out. Back lost in the frozen waste, I pick up the Ring of the Embedded. This slightly confusing ring increases vigor, endurance, and vitality, but not by a set amount. The increase is inversely proportional to the stat level. In other words, the lower the stat, the better the increase. For being soul level one, I'm rocking some pretty decent stats now. I mean, look at that, 1880p. Still stupid though. Well, I think that's enough DLC for now. Back in prequel lands between, I head to Aldia's Keep. What in the world is that thing? I don't recall ever fighting one of those before. I think this ogre breaks out of this cage. I should probably try to kill it before it tries to kill me. Can't trick me, game. I see that ogre hiding behind the wall. Okay, maybe you can trick me. Guardian Dragon time, and I have literally nothing to say about this boss. I can't do the I'm over leveled bit because I'm literally as under leveled as I could be without using glitches, but like, this boss is a pushover. It keeps trying to step on me, then eventually gives up and flies all over the place. Maybe its strategy was to make me die of boredom? Hey there, Aldia, you looking a little small. Is it cold in here? Listen, if the game is gonna let me use crossbows, I'm gonna use crossbows, okay? Hey everyone, don't mind me, I definitely bested your top warrior in honorable hand-to-hand -hand combat and I have no idea how 200 crossbow bolts got embedded in his chest. Was it me? <laughs> I telepathically spoke to the living embodiment of the phrase damage sponge until it gave me the ash and mist heart, then did the classic toe strat. You wanna know why I think this thing has way too much health? It's because I literally wedged myself here, attacking non-stop aside from dodging, and not only did my buff wear off, my weapon almost broke too. Like, I know that I'm not the apex predator with this build or anything, but that is entirely too much health. I now have a staggering 130,000 souls and I'm running out of things to spend them on, but I could do with a good restock of repair powder. Unfortunately, I get invaded. Once again, I try to wordlessly convey I mean him no harm and just want to be left alone, but I think he thinks I want a fisticuff duel, so I do the only thing I can think of. Allow myself to be murdered by a random enemy. I do feel a little bad. These players just want to enjoy the game too, but I don't PvP. My next goal is to collect the remaining souls of the giant so I can commit undead regicide, so to that end I enter the memory of Vamir. I take my sweet time however and end up getting kicked out before I got to finish. Second time I make sure to pick up the pace. Okay, maybe not that fast. Does anyone know if this Sparrow's Lockstone does anything or is it just there to troll the player? Anyway, next boss is the giant lord and I'm ready. Cheap game 0 out of 10. The actual fight is, well, you all know how it goes, it's literally just the last giant, plus a sword. I make a couple of quick stops just to move Gavlin around because poison in this game is surprisingly good, that and I'm also kind of running out of things to spend my excess souls on. Anyway, in the Black Gulch I find the two giants I need to take on for the final soul of the giant. Yep, just the way Miyazaki intended. 
Time to take on Vendrick. I really want to say he's an easy boss, but in these circumstances he actually puts up a bit of a fight. Also, I learned that he has a ranged attack? I don't think I've ever seen that before. Probably best not to get hit by it though. That's not a joke or a cut to me getting hit by it, I'm sometimes good at video games. With the last of all Kingsfeld, I could either go in the game, which honestly is the smarter decision, or I can take on a bunch of random bosses. And of course, I will choose the random bosses every time. First up is the Flexile Sentry. Now this boss is weak to poison, but he's also standing in water, so... Yeah, not a problem. Next is the Belfry Gargoyles. I also have nothing to say about this fight. It's literally just the Dark Souls 1 fight, but more. Then I head towards the Grave of Saints, making sure to pick up the Dragon Talon on my way to fight the Royal Rat Vanguard. Now, I'd like to tell you that nothing happened here either, but then I'd be lying. I died to the Royal Rat Vanguard. I know, I know, my gamer card is going to be suspended. But seriously though, this fight isn't hard, just pull in any early 90s RPG and murder every rat you see. Next on my hit list is the Executioner's Chariot. The boss itself isn't so bad, the problem is the run back, made even worse by the fact that I apparently am stupid. I did the old jump to the side of the bridge trick to get the enemies to back off, but that still leaves Mr. Big Unruly Sword over there. But believe it or not, you can actually shoot through these bars. Dark Souls 2, never change. Okay, so the boss... It exists? I thought about going for the secret arrow finisher, but really, what's the point when it dies so fast anyway? Totally not Ornstein is next, and he's apparently weak to fire, magic, and... strafing? Huh? Didn't know that was a damage type. Maybe next I'll do a Can You Beat Dark Souls 2 by Only Strafing video. By my count, that is every boss in the base game except for the final trio. What? A Dark Lurker? Do I have to? I hate that I like the Dark Lurker fight so much because he is a right pain in the ass to get to. Fortunately, I learned from a very reliable source that you can save state in the Abyss Chasms, and I am absolutely going to do that. First though, I have to talk to Dark Diver Gandalf over here in three locations before I can even be let into his exclusive little club. I thought I would take on the Drang Lake Castle Chasm first, assuming it would be the hardest because of the Havel wannabe, but that actually wasn't the case. His attacks don't one-shot me, and I'm able to parry him pretty easily. The next threat was Mr. Stabzalaw, but this was also going okay, right up until he decided I just don't get to live anymore. That's fine, really. Fine, play lame, win games. This chasm actually ended up being the easiest of the three, believe it or not, and the next one I went to was the Black Gulch, and I hate this one. Several times I would roll to avoid an instant death hammer, only to get hit instead by an instant death fireball. This place sucks, but once again, it's nothing a little bit of heavily inflicted poison damage can't solve. The final chasm in the Shaded Woods was a bit of a middle ground. Technically speaking, it's the one I died least in, as I didn't die here at all, but it still felt harder than the castle and easier than the gulch. So, the Dark Lurker. I really like the design of this boss, it reminds me a lot of a Kingdom Hearts enemy, and his attacks are all, well, I mean, unique, I guess? It's not a knight in armor is what I'm trying to say. The first time he got to phase 2, however, I quickly became annoyed. One of his clones decided to do that fireball attack five times in a row. At one point, the other clone joined in just to make it six total. I straight up felt like I was waiting my turn to attack. I also decided I would start using bright bugs because, I mean, what else am I holding on to them for? But the damage increase looked kind of bad. Like, that hardly looks like an increase at all. I guess since it is percentage based, that kind of makes sense, but still, kind of a letdown. Funnily enough, the same attempt I tried my first Bright Bug is the same one that I won on. Coincidence? Yeah, definitely. Well, that's all the base game bosses done sans the final trio, so there is nowhere left to run. It is time to tackle the DLCs. Technically, there is one other item missing from this build, Flynn's Ring, which is located in the Sunken Crown expansion, so I figured I might as well start there. Well, that and because it has the easiest bosses, in my opinion. It can be a bit confusing with the rising pillars and stuff, but I... Oh, god damn it. Well, maybe third time's a charm for convincing them I don't want to fight. I knew I should have walked off a cliff when I had a chance. Fortunately for me, that is the last time I get invaded by a player in this run, as I decided not to burn effigies at bonfires, but rather construct bonfires out of effigies. Progressing further, I pick up Lens Ring. This boosts damage based on your maximum equip load, which is neat, but also confusing. Swift like the wind while wearing 59 unspecified weight units? Yeah, alright, whatever game. The reason I waited so long to grab it though was honestly because I already had all my ring slots taken up, so I didn't think it would make much of a difference unless I wanted to return to human and replace the ring of binding, which to be fair I did do a few times. Now allow me to tell you a heartbreaking tale. Imagine, if you will, that you have dived deep into the poison castle, slowly and methodically taking out enemies one at a time, making sure to evade every trap and gang squad, then in the distance, you see it. The bonfire. The checkpoint. If you can just make it there, everything will be fine. Then Dark Souls 2 says no. 
It was at this point my patience started wearing thin, and I'm not even to the hard part yet. Way back at the beginning of the video, I mentioned how SL1 was awful in this game, and it's mostly due to the DLC. Don't get me wrong, I am very aware that using items like the Vessel Shield, only obtainable from the Ivory King expansion, is making the base game easier, but as is tradition, the DLCs for FromSoft games have much harder content, so the feeling of pain is amplified here. But never let it be said I'm not persistent, so after taking a nice long swig of my Estus, I get back to it. While I was exploring the dilapidated temple, I was already agonizing over having to do this run back, only to turn a corner and see a note on the ground. As if I was possessed, I clicked on the wall and revealed it wasn't a fake note, and there was in fact a bonfire behind it. I legitimately did not know about this one's existence, and it was a Gwyn send. So fine, always online Dark Souls 2, I'll be fair and give you one point for that guy's note. Still at like a negative 4 million because of forced invasions, but hey, it's a start. Alana is up first, and I was worried about... Well, not her, obviously. She is a very easy boss. Slow, predictable melee swings, and I mean, sure, if you're at range, she'll start lobbing projectiles, but as long as she's in frame, they're also well telegraphed and easy to avoid. Nope, unsurprisingly, it's the summons that make this fight a chore. I never got the pigs, so I can't talk about those, but the skeletons are easy enough to deal with going down in just a couple of hits. It's Big Bell and Velstat that's the problem. I do think that they work well together, having to keep both in frame while dipping into Alana's melee range to stop her from doing any range attacks, but at soul level 1, it's a little less strategy and a lot more screaming. Because I don't have a crazy amount of damage, I figured it would be all but required to beat Velstat should she summon him in, or get crazy lucky with her only ever bringing in the Bone Squad. However, on my winning attempt, neither of those things happened. I mean, yes, she summoned him, but I just ignored him and went after her. It also helped that she didn't summon him until she was below half HP, which allowed me to get in a lot of damage during the animation, but hey, if it works. Immediately following that fight is Sin the Slumbering Dragon. To be honest, I have virtually nothing to say about this boss. I mean, I like him and something something stupid hitboxes, but overall, this is just a good solid dragon fight. I guess I can say that I was a tiny bit worried before going into it, because when I fought him normally, my greatsword broke when he was about one hit away from death and reversed Uno card me, but that didn't happen here. No, this time, we just died at the same time. I know I just got greedy here, but like, that first stab definitely should have hit him. Whatever, a few tries later and he goes down. Normally I would be happy about beating a boss, but I'm not because now I have to go fight the gank squad. I strongly considered full clearing this run back to them, but didn't because I had one strategy, one small bit of hope this fight would be easy. Big shout out to JK Leeds here for showing me how absolutely busted Poison can be in this game with his Poison Throwing Knives video, you guys should check that out if you haven't already. He's actually also the one that told me you can save state in the Abyss. To be honest, without his help, I might have lost my sanity on this run. Anyway, through him, I learned the Gang Squad can easily and reliably be poisoned for big damage. Now the hard part was making sure I safely applied it without getting a face full of Dragon Tooth. After a few attempts, I settled on a strategy of making a huge loop around the arena, then getting one drive-by poke on the archer before repeating the process. It was tedious, but also pretty safe. Once the archer was out of the way, I should be able to just play it safe and poison throwing knife the other two, and sure, that could work, but I noticed something. While I was running around, I would occasionally walk a little further than I thought I would be able to off this ledge. Couple that with this note being here, and... No, there's no way you can stand there, right? Wrong. Oh, Dark Souls, never stop being you. The enemies aren't programmed to attack me because they can't see a clear path, but also my throwing knives hit the stalactites in front of me, but then I have visions of Rickard and can just stab them through the terrain. I am not above this. It was slow, and I would occasionally slip off, but if it works, it ain't stupid. I thought about ending the fight with a parry repose because I'm semi-decent at doing that to Havel, but I also likely used up a century's worth of luck in this run already and decided not to push it. With that, one DLC is down. Neither of the two remaining expansions will be easier than the other, so I decided to just start with the old Iron King first since I had more or less cleared it except for the bosses. I like the Sir Alone fight, so I figured I would do him next. Oh no. Cool, so I thought to get into his memory you only had to have the Ash and Mist art because, you know, memory, but no, you also have to beat the Fume Knight. Alright. The only thing worth noting on the way there is that I got invaded by Forlorn, but his dumb ass can't work elevators, so actually it wasn't worth noting at all. Fume Knight, the supposed hardest boss in the game, at least statistically, as it was reported he killed more players than anything else. I think. I didn't actually research that and just saw it one time on a Reddit post, but I'm pretty sure it's true. Anyway, I don't think he's that hard. I mean, I don't think he's particularly easy either, but I don't get the Fume Knight so hard mindset. Okay, I deserve that. My only real complaint with him is his hitboxes, particularly in the second phase. I don't know why I'm complaining about it here though, because the final boss I'll do in this DLC is literally just bad hitbox the boss, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Fume Knight is a good fight. His moves are all well telegraphed and he gets more aggressive in phase 2, signaling more urgency in the situation. It really is a well put together encounter. Could you imagine if more enemies were like this? I guess you get something like Elden Ring, I mean Dark Souls 2 too. On the winning attempt, I was one attack away from hitlessing him, and he just had to rip that out from under me, but it's okay. 
in the end, I am more than happy to be this single solitary Fume Knight's worthy challenger, and why would I ever want more than that? Next boss up on the chopping block is the run back before Sir alone because it's harder than the actual fight is. I went ahead and cleared out all the enemies to make them stop spawning. I swear the devs knew how crappy some of these runbacks were, but instead of fixing it, they just decided to make the enemies stop spawning after a while. Sir alone is another fantastic fight. All of his attacks are telegraphed and easy to dodge. Well, easy in a theoretical sense at least. The only one I had problems with was his lunging uppercut slash. It seems like there was a fast version and a slow version. Preemptively dodging for the fast version would get me roll caught, but I just couldn't react fast enough to the quick one if he was at medium range. I'm not completely sure, but I think the speed he lunges with is determined by how quickly he lowers his sword. This might just be a Doom is slowly losing his mind so he's seeing things kind of deal, but that's how it felt. Anyway, I managed to reclaim some of my lost sanity by actually getting the special seppuku death animation because I no-hit the fight. This is my first time ever doing that, so that's cool. But now the fun is all over, and I guess it's time to fight every Soul Level 1 runner's nightmare fuel, Blue Smelter. Once again, I am employing the clear out every enemy that I can because this run back blows chunk strategy. I opt to take the high road because it's honestly easier to attack the enemies up here, but the two sets of caves enemies, I just throw my body at them repeatedly until they stop spawning. As long as I take at least one with me per attempt, that's all that matters. In the final room, I found I could set up in a specific way so that this possessed armor couldn't hit me while I could just pelt him with bolts, then I would drop down and take care of the astrologer. At this point, I could have used my crossbow to deal with the iron warrior, but because he's so far away and wanders around a lot, I'd just be wasting some of my bolts. So, the better option I found would be to simply feather out and repeat until the astrologer stopped respawning, then position right on the edge of this ledge and use the lock on to handle him. Because there was nothing he could do to hit me, and there was no other enemies to fight, this ensured a guaranteed attempt at the smelter with full health, or nearly full health depending on how I fell off the ledge. For Blueberry Smelter, I opted to go for Rotten Pine Resin because he's weak to poison for some reason. The optimal way would be to poison him with throwing knives and use lightning on my weapon to maximize damage, but am lazy. Well that, but also the poison wears off so fast it's actually possible to get multiple applications in with one resin, so this is just all around easier. He took me a couple dozen tries, but eventually Blue Smelter Demon's Fire gets put out. Yes, I know it's not blue fire and it's magic, you don't have to tell me. Or maybe do, after all, comments are good for the YouTube algorithm. One DLC left, and it's time to take on perhaps the worst zone ever put into a video game. Frigid Outskirts. I'm not gonna waste your time. If you've ever been through this area, then you know how badly it sucks and why. So what did I do? Well, first I tried just running, just sprinting all the way to the boss fog. The problem with that is even if you make it there, you're bound to get hit, which would reduce your Estus or life gems. That is, if you can even frickin' make it to the boss fog. The second plan was to just clear out every reindeer. It would be slow and tedious, but they do stop responding at some point. Except this too is a big pain in the dick. They hit pretty hard, not enough to always one-shot, but this stupid charge attack is by far the worst offender of a crappy hitbox in this game. I tried several times to just clear them out, but like half of those attempts would just be me dying before I could even bring one of them down, meaning it was strictly a waste of time. Then I had to set through two loading screens to try it again. I ended up giving up on that strategy too, so what did I do? I summoned the NPCs and we ruined everyone's Christmas by slaughtering every reindeer we could find. I was 31 hours into this run and still had a few difficult bosses left. I do not regret this, not in the slightest. I very rarely summon anything, even in a casual playthrough, but this place, oh, this zone can rot in the deepest part of hell. Actually, if I remember correctly from 9th grade English class, the lowest layer of hell is frozen over, so good job on that, Miyazaki. Anyway, I wave goodbye to my venison collecting friends because I have to take on the boss by myself, then proceed to save scum outside the door because, again, screw this place. Don't worry, I paid for my devious methods by having to fight Ludd and Zalin. I can also show off how stupid I am because I totally forgot repair powder doesn't work on weapons that are already completely broken, then in a panic tried to equip my mace and I rolled into attack and died. Cool, awesome, I love it. I don't really have much to say about the actual fight though, it's just Ava but less health and there's two of them. You might have noticed that I'm unlocking my camera to attack them. It's not just because there's two of them, it's because the rapier has a weirdly tight hitbox so I found myself frequently missing them while locked on and I hate it. I'm not a huge fan of thrusting weapons for this specific reason. I have no idea how I didn't get grabbed here and this was on the winning attempt so if Zolin could have emotions I'm sure it would be salt. I actually couldn't out DPS the heal but that's fine as long as I play it cool, victory is mine. One DLC boss left, and it was the one I feared the most, but first I need to enlist the help of a few nigh-invincible knights, so back to the frozen castle I go. Eventually I find myself face to face with Witch Donna, and I wasn't sure what to do. See, I remember her spells absolutely obliterating my level 200 something odd character, so level 1? Ha! <laughs> As if. My first plan was to try and hit her from far away with my crossbow, but she has that big shield and it's just not gonna happen. Going back to the elevator and waiting a second until she forgets I exist, I think maybe I can poison her and just run away? So I sneak up behind her and she... 
Leaves? I... Did she get bored of waiting on me? Whatever, this is my chance. I quickly free the Lois Knight and get out of there. Clearing out more of the zone, I was invaded by Holy Knight Arheim. Great. Awesome. I love it. Why not throw more Forlorns at me while you're at it? Anyway, I know this NPC pretends to be a barrel, and yes, I did learn that the hard way my first time, so I thought let's have a little fun. First, we played the most boring game of Red Light Green Light until he just broke the rules, then we played Figure Out How Bad Dark Souls 2 Pathing Can Be. I don't actually know how he got himself stuck there, but whatever, here we are. Anyway, what I was actually curious about was why Donna despawned. I went and looked online, and according to the wiki, invaders have a 15 minute time limit, but does that apply to NPCs too? I figured, why not find out? So I stood here, in this one spot, watching that NPC twitch back and forth for 15 or so minutes until... he left. I guess patience really is the key to beating these games. That's all I have to say about this area and nothing eventful happens getting the last night, so now it's time to take on my one true nightmare, the Burnt Ivory King. See, when I did this DLC normally, he was the one boss to put up a real fight, I just could not handle the encounter. Maybe it was less the boss himself and more the ads prior to the fight, but regardless, I was not hopeful and very stressed about it. I asked some of the other challenge runners what I should do, and I fully expected to get a flurry of get goods, but instead I got the single greatest piece of advice ever. Pancake strat, bro. Apparently, with a large or great club, it is possible to just flatten the charred knights, temporarily taking them out of the fight, which can then be chained until they die. I... what? You're telling me this fight can be trivialized? Just like that? I don't know whether to be happy or angry. I'll make a quick mention for anyone doing this at home, I had to grab the strength ring from the broom tower in order to actually use this club. On the winning attempt, I actually got really lucky with the downtime between the final gate being sealed and the burnt ivory king appearing, allowing me to reset my gear to be more efficient. I did think about doing this boss with the Great Club, but opted not to just because I wasn't familiar with its moveset. Like I said earlier, the boss himself is pretty easy compared to the party beforehand, and even more so when he decides to wait until 40% HP to go full lightsaber mode. I gotta say, this was the one fight I was absolutely terrified of in this run, and I'm so glad it's finished. Now, the DLC is completed, and it's time for the final gauntlet. First up is the Throne Watcher and Defender. I was a bit worried because is dual boss, but honestly, they're kind of pushovers. I mean, don't get me wrong, they still beat me up a couple of times, but they kind of seem to never gang up on me, unlike a certain duo boss that shall not be named. Also, you might have noticed I'm using the Ice Rapier now. I didn't farm this, I actually picked it up much earlier, but didn't know until now that it was considered better than the normal one, so I was unintentionally making this game harder. Oh well. To be honest, the fight was more boring than anything else. It was a lot of walking backwards and getting one poke in than just repeating that for like five minutes. Eventually, I shove my ice toothpick right in the throne defender's dick and he takes a knee. At this point, all I have to do is wait for the watcher to try and heal him, but greed is key and the duo boss falls. Nashandra shows up, and I'm not expecting a difficult fight, but just in case, I warp out of there as I didn't have any Estus, but surprise, I first tried her. Sorry that I don't have anything interesting to say about her, we all know she's an incredibly easy and underwhelming boss, which is conveniently a great segue into Aldia. This fight also confuses me. I mean, mechanically speaking, it's one of the easiest fights in the whole series, and he awards zero souls, so it's definitely not meant to make you feel like you're overcoming a challenge. Unfortunately, my foreign intelligence means I can't understand the lore of this game, and I just unga bunga, or in my case, pokey poke, until he dies, and I have beaten Dark Souls 2 at soul level 1. Thank Gwyn, because I am never doing that again. Thank you everyone for watching, and an extra special thanks to my patrons. Stay beautiful, y'all. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider giving a like and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. Also, why not check out when I beat Bloodborne at Blood Level 4? So far, it's the only other Soul Level 1 run that's rivaled this one in difficulty. But until next time, my friends, don't you dare go hollow.